Hi, everyone. So uh, first, I want to thank my colleague at Fordham, Lance Strait, for inviting me to deliver a talk today. Um, I was able to attend the, the keynote on Friday, and I've been following along uh, with the Twitter feed covering the symposium. A uh, shout out to Hannah, uh, an IGS intern and a student of mine uh, currently. So it's an honor to be in conversation with you all. Um, second, I would be remiss if I did not disclose that general semantics is not my scholarly area of expertise at all. Uh, so I'm very nervous, but hopefully you all will, um, you know, welcome me into the into the fray. Um, though I did receive my doctorate in a department that used to be called semiotics at Brown, so I do know a bit about symbols and meaning making. I'm formally trained in film and television studies and what you might call critical race theory, which has become quite a charged floating signifier in our current social and political climate in the United States. We can talk about that in the Q&A uh, and its implications if you would like. But my work in theories and histories of African-American cultural production and media representation is fundamentally tied to the project of Black Studies, um, which I see as a fundamental sort of radical intervention in knowledge production. And so for this talk, I hope that you will indulge me in a thought experiment that attempts to think through the expansiveness of general semantics as it might connect to the matter of Blackness. Specifically, I am interested in analyzing how speculative fiction television functions as a generative way to engage issues of race and anti-Black violence. Um, so some of this talk will be uh, ideas that have, you know, I, I've been sort of circling around for, for years, uh, and much of it will also be sort of pure speculation um, and uh, provocation. Right. Uh, and so I, I you know, I, I want to start by saying, you know, Fred Moten, who is a scholar, critical theorist, um, says that the history of blackness is testament to the fact that objects can and do resist. So what do I do when I don't know anything about a field? Um, I do research. Uh, so uh, I want to take us down uh, memory lane and in preparing my remarks, two historical pieces from et cetera, a review of general semantics stood out as pertinent to my analysis. So in 1942, the journal published two brief articles on race by British American anthropologist M.F. Ashley Montagu. And the, um, I'll get to the second piece in, uh, in a bit, but what I wanna do uh, is sort of go through Montague's piece, um, which I think is really fascinating as a you know, historical document. Um, he critiques the anthropological idea of race using the metaphor of an indigestible omelet. Um, I, will, <laughs> I will read, uh, the process of averaging the characters of a given group, knocking the individuals together, giving them a good stirring, and then serving the resulting omelet as a race, is essentially the anthropological process of race making. It may be good cooking, but it is not science, since it serves to confuse rather than to clarify. When an omelet is done, it has a fairly uniform character, though the ingredients which have gone into its making may have been variable. This is what the anthropological conception of race is. It is an omelet which corresponds to nothing in nature. It is an indigestible dish conjured into being by an anthropological chef from a number of ingredients which are extremely variable in the characters which they present. The omelet called race has no existence outside the statistical frying pan in which it has been reduced by the heat of the anthropological imagination. So these are very strong, <laughs> strong metaphorical words. Um, later, uh, he concludes, you know, again, and really sort of indicting the field of anthropology um, and their conception of race that is fundamentally artificial, right? Um, that it does not agree with the facts, that it leads to confusion and the perpetuation of error, and finally, that for all these reasons, it is meaningless. Or rather, more accurately, such meaning as it possesses is false. And I think that last sort of clause is really, is really important. Being so weighed down with false meaning, it were better that the term were dropped altogether than that any attempt should be made um, to give it a new meaning. 
Great. So Montague, who gave the very first Alfred Korzybski Memorial Lecture, rightfully refutes the notion of race as inherently biological. He argues that race as a concept um, later uh, in the piece can be replaced by the concept of ethnicity and ultimately that the term should be discarded entirely in favor of something like caste. And clearly we did not do away with the concept of race, um, but only amplified it in both unproductive and productive ways. Herman Gray, sociologist, um, provides a useful, somewhat Foucauldian definition of race as a technique of power. He states, quote, we might say that race is the expression of the mutually constitutive effects of media, science, the state, and economic markets. The media, the press, commercial broadcast systems, digital platforms, and digital social networks are scenes where social relations, representations, understandings, and feelings about racial differences among us circulate." End quote. The status of media and mediation with respect to race has always been fraught. Montague in particular telegraphed a kind of resistance to stereotype analysis, right? In that kind of omelet, uh, the sort of critique of the omelet of race. In current discussions of race and representation, it is difficult but necessary to move beyond the stereotype. And I tell this to my students every single day, right? When they want to immediately focus on stereotype and by extension, what we denote in film and TV studies as so-called positive and negative imagery, which ends up flattening one's object of study. It does not allow for the polysemic ways in which audiences encounter representations and understand their messages. Approaches to representations of blackness in particular have had a pesky tendency to not only rely on the fixity of the image as stereotype, but also sort of really gestures towards this kind of um, desire for some kind of indexical realism, right? Um, which restricts uh, possible ways to engage and read media depictions. Montague's pieces uh, became an early examination of race as a social construct. Um, and his emphasis on language extends 27 years later to another piece that I want to show from Memory Lane, uh, from the journal, uh, What's in a Name? Negro versus African-American versus Black. And so uh, this piece uh, was written by uh, Lerone Bennett Jr. Uh, who is, was a historian. It appeared in the journal in 1969. Bennett, as I said, was a historian of African-American life and race relations. He served as an executive editor of Ebony Magazine starting in 1958 and worked there until his, 19, uh, into his 80s. And his passion for exploring Black experience through words remained until his death in 2018. In the piece for the journal, he outlines, quote, for Americans of African descent have been arguing about names ever since they were forcibly transported from Africa by Europeans. The article effectively highlights the longstanding debate about how black folks identify and self fashion themselves through language across social movements and cultural changes. Fascinatingly, Bennett recounts an exchange in 1928 in the NAACP's magazine, The Crisis, between a reader and the magazine's creator, W.E.B. Du Bois. And so I want to show this exchange, right? Um, so this is Ronald Barton, reader. Um, Dear sir, I am only a high school student in my sophomore year and have not the understanding of you college educated men <laughs> already coming out. Um, it seems to me that since the crisis is the official organ of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which stand for equality for all Americans, why would it designate and segregate us as Negroes and not as Americans? The most piercing thing that hurts me in this February crisis, which forced me to write, was the notice that called the natives of Africa Negroes instead of calling them Africans or natives. The word Negro or the N word is a white man's word to make us feel inferior. I hope to be a worker for my race. That is why I wrote this letter. 
I hope that by the time I become a man, that this word Negro will be abolished. Right? So here's the boys' response. <laughs> Roland, do not at the outset of your career make the all too common error of mistaking names for things. Names are only conventional signs for identifying things. Things are the reality that counts. If a thing is despised, either because of ignorance or because it's, it is despicable, you will not alter matters by changing its name. If men despise Negroes, they will not despise them less if Negroes are called colored or Afro-Americans. Moreover, you cannot change the name of a thing at will. Names are not merely matters of thought and reason. They are growths and habits. As long as the majority of men mean black or brown folk when they say Negro, so long will Negro be the name of folks brown and black. And neither anger nor wailing nor tears can or will change the name until the name habit changes. Your will, and, and later he says, he, he wrote a very long um, uh, response. Your real work, my dear young man, does not lie with names. It is not a matter of changing them, losing them, or forgetting them. Names are nothing but little guideposts along the way. The way would be there, and just as hard and just as long if there were no guideposts, but not quite as easily followed. Your real work as a Negro lies in two directions. First, to let the world know what there is fine and genuine about the Negro race. And secondly, to see that there is nothing about that race which is worth contempt. Your contempt, my contempt, or the contempt of the wide, wide world. Get this then, Roland, and get it straight, even if it pierces your soul. A Negro by any other name would be just as black and just as white, just as ashamed of himself and just as ashamed by others as today. It is not the name, it's the thing that counts. Come on, kid, let's go get the thing. Um, I find this a very sort of blunt and brilliant, uh, you know, response uh, that also I think has, um, you know, uh, implications for general semantics as a field uh, in the way that Du Bois is very, um, you know, persuasively talking about uh, the word and the thing. Uh, and, this, and also, you know, related to my interest with Lovecraft Country, the way that he uses metaphors around um, guideposts and guiding and sort of maps and thinking around around uh, questions of terrain and, and directionality. Okay. So wrestling with terminology at such a tumultuous political time, Bennett asserts that, quote, millions of Americans of African descent are going to have to search their souls and their internal maps, end quote. In the course of movement, one will have to, quote, choose a name in the process of choosing his being. He ends by asking the questions, who are you? What is your name? It is in this spirit of inquiry that I want to turn to media arts in an examination of HBO's 2020 program, Lovecraft Country. Created by Misha Green, the fantasy horror series adapts the novel of the same name written by Matt Ruff. It follows Atticus Tick Freeman's journey across geographies to search for his missing father and in the process, he unearths a spectacular and supernatural secret about his familial lineage. The TV series signifies on HP Lovecraftian language to create and communicate a black life world, both visually and sonically. By signify, I mean the black cultural practice of playing with language and expectation articulated in Henry Louis Gates Jr. Uh, classic late 1980s text, the signifying monkey, a theory of African-American literary criticism. This is an important rhetorical strategy for black expression emerging from African traditions of storytelling, right? And so, you know, what, one thing I will say about uh, Lovecraft Country at the outset, it, you know, is that when I say that it's signifying on Love, Lovecraftian language, um, that's recognizing that Lovecraft, you know, Lovecraft's own virulent racism, anti-Semitism, and, and xenophobia. Um, he, you know, has said things like, quote, the Negro is fundamentally the biological inferior of all white and even Mongolian races. Um, he wrote a 1912 poem uh, called On the Creation of the N-Words, uh, where Black people reside in liminal space between man and beast. And so, 
you know, the the program, uh, or rather Ruff, uh, the white author, attempts to contend with Lovecraft's white supremacy uh, through centering Black experience. But it is Misha Green, uh, who is a Black creative, uh, who also um, was at the helm of the uh, short-lived show Underground, uh, as well as uh, Jordan Peele, as executive producer, and J.J. Abrams, um, who televisually depict uh, the, the narrative set in Jim Crow America, and it has a kind of different vitality um, to it. So Lovecraft Country is an example of what I call in my larger work, Black Lives Matter Television, or BLM TV. For almost 10 years as both a scholar and spectator, I have been interested in how the medium of television and its claims to immediacy and relevance navigates the current climate of anti-Black violence. Um, and I, you know, television studies is very much emph uh, emphasized the role of liveness, uh, this idea that television is going on uh, versus uh, other mediums like film or photography, uh, which is really focused on the that has been, right? And so television um, has a sort of claim to a particular sort of immediacy um, that it likes to showcase all the time, as we see in, in news. The murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota on May 25th, uh, 2020, and the global protest that summer solidified television's still lucrative role in creating and disseminating messages around social and political unrest. As I asked that summer, what do we want and need from television right now? What are the limitations and possibilities of the medium in addressing and redressing anti-Black violence? As a commercial medium, TV has seemed to shift from the discourse of promoting racial relevance to the practicing an active reckoning with race at the level of the industry text and audience. The term BLM TV explicitly calls to mind Sasha Torres's rendering of King TV to discuss the cycle of non-fictional and fictional programming connected to the beating of Rodney King and the subsequent uprisings in LA in 1991. These texts from news coverage to drama series work together to construct ideas around TV's mediation of the racial politics of law and order during the early 1990s. The infamous video footage of King being pummeled on the ground by law enforcement circulated on screen in a similar fashion to contemporary cell phone recordings of black individuals like Michael Brown and Philando Castile shot and slain by police officers. In my TV race and civil rights undergraduate class, we discussed the resonances between journalistic accounts of rebellion connected to racial violence from the early 90s to our current demonstrations 30 years later. So in the rest, I want to analyze not news reporting, but the broader formation and significance of BLM TV. The cycle begins in 2013, the year that the hashtag Black Lives Matter became a rallying cry in response to the acquittal of George Zimmerman for the killing of Trayvon Martin. Since then, TV programs have remarked on this history of violence in explicit and implicit ways. It is important to note that not every program that centers Black people today can and should be considered Black Lives Matter TV. Rather, BLM TV is an amalgamation of non-narrative and narrative approaches to interrogating structural racism and anti-Blackness on and off screen. And so, some characteristics of Black Lives, um, Black Lives Matter TV that I've sort of seen um, is that the messages that are conveyed in the most generative of such programs are not solely focused on grappling with the material and psychic violence of anti-Black racism. Rather, they have the tendency to combine expressions of trauma and joy, striving to depict the complexity and fullness of Black experience. In this way, there's a degree of commitment to the goal of cultivating what Tina Camp has described as a black gaze. By this, she means not just a black perspective, but an attentiveness to quote, a politics of looking with, through, and alongside another, a gaze that requires effort and exertion. And finally, I suggest that BLM TV is fundamentally concerned with the idea of reparations. Previously, I have written about televisual reparations as an ontological question for the medium that has aesthetic, political, and ethical implications with respect to racial blackness. Reparations in this way underscore how blackness comes to be televisually transmitted to audiences through the realm of spirits, spirits that come to resonate with viewers 
and call forth engagement with and response to representations of black mortality in the afterlife of slavery. Thus TV can bring out the dead as a means of redressing violence associated with America's dark past. And I can talk more about reparations again in the Q&A. I think it's another term, you know, rhetorically that has um, the way that we understand it is, is quite different now. And it has become, you know, a lot more popular, uh, especially after Ta-Nehisi Coates' um, award-winning essay, The Case for Reparations, uh, came out. And so Lovecraft Country's uh, tagline is take back your legacy, right? Um, and so I think this is very much in line with this kind of reparative, um, th this reparative gesture. Um, how much time do I have? Two okay, so I actually will try to show um, this and leave it here. Um, this is a, a clip from the first episode of the series, uh, the main character, um, Tick, uh, and his uncle George and his uh, friend Letty are on a road trip to um, Arkham, Massachusetts to locate Tick's missing father. Um, I'll try to see if I can show this. First time. Oh, it's only and, playing uh, here. The position of a kind of Jeremiah. But for example, I don't disagree with Mr. Burfoot that the... Um, the inequality summoned by the American liberal population of the United States has hindered the American dream. Indeed it has. I quarrel with some other things he has said. The other deeper element of a certain awkwardness I feel has to do with, um, it has to do with one's point of view. I had to put it that way. One's, uh, one's sense of one's system of reality. It would seem to me that the proposition before the House, and I put it that way, is the American dream at the expense of the American Negro, all the American dream is at the expense of the American Negro, is a question hideously loaded, and that one's response to that question, or one's reaction to that question, has to depend on an effect on where you find yourself in the world, what your sense of reality is, what your system of reality is. That is, it depends on assumptions which we hold so deeply as to be scarcely aware of them. A white South Africa, or a Mississippi sharecropper, or a Mississippi sheriff, or a Frenchman driven out of Algeria, all had at bottom a system of reality which compels them to, for example, in the case of the French exile from Algeria, to defend French reasons for having ruled Algeria. The Mississippi or the Alabama sheriff, who really does believe when he's facing a Negro boy or girl, that this woman, this man, this child, must be insane to attack the system to which he owes his entire identity. And on the other hand, there's a diner called Lydia's. I got a tip on me. Okay. Won't take a soup on our course to have lunch there. Thank what you. do you say for a detour? Okay. I'm going to pause it there. Um, notice if you can see the, the map that George is... is it's right there. Um, and so uh, obviously that was James Baldwin. Uh, it was uh, his uh, speech uh, during a uh, debate with conservative William F. Buckley. Uh, the speech was called The American Dream and the American Negro. Um, and it functions as the non-diegetic narrative to the montage sequence. Uh, Baldwin's signature voice is juxtaposed with scenes from Americana under Jim Crow segregation. Um, and so uh, again, I, I'm going to end here, but I just would like to, you know, offer up, you know, issues around if you've seen Lovecraft Country, uh, you know, it's very much they're going through this kind of inhospitable terrain. Uh, and so they use a guidebook. George is creating this guidebook, which is supposed to be a kind of green book, um, you know, to use by black travelers, right, to help them uh, navigate through uh, this kind of terror psychology, right, this, this sort of environment that has to be navigated differentially with respect to race. Um, and so, you know, I'm interested in that kind of mapping, uh, but also in the ways in which blackness comes to sort of emerge, right, um, through through the sort of sonic scape of the entire series, um, as well as the visuals. And then um, finally, I would be remiss um, or far be it for me to argue with Neil Postman <laughs> about the merits or lack thereof of television, right? But what if TV could activate um, act affects, provoke sensorial impulses uh, and emotions, uh, you know, 
What if TV could point us to an elsewhere, a fugitive kind of being in the world? What if TV could fly, right? And so this is Random Acts of Flyness. I highly recommend it. Um, it's uh, an HBO series by an experimental filmmaker, Terrence Nass, Nance. Um, and the tagline is shift consciousness, right? Um, it's a kind of public access uh, uh, meets variety sketch uh, program. And uh, I think it sort of, again, points to that kind of speculative uh, future that we might think uh, as really generative for the medium. So yeah, thank you. <laughs>